Jen had kind of spontaneously asked me to ask if I would create some sort of a presentation. So I've just gone through the text and pulled out some of the, um, I think, important points from the point of view of Dharma and from the point of view of um, practice, you know, how to uh, support one's practice, what is practice, that kind of thing, straight from the text. So if you have your book, you know, there'll be a page number for everything, and we can all turn to that page. Um, these are just, you know, just off the cuff what slides. And um, if, you know, the discussion can go wherever it wants to go, um, whatever supports you all and um, supports. Jen, I'm going to mute you out. There's a lot of noise going on. Sorry. I uh, went and got my book. Um, so it's just that simple, you know, that, that what we're going to do here today. Um, I appreciated that Jen began including the, uh, the praise of Shakyamuni Buddha. Though there, he is the fourth Buddha supposedly to this world, uh, since its beginning, um, we only know of him, like we have the Dharma from him. And it is said over and over again, including by the Buddha himself, Shakyamuni, that by honoring the Buddhas, including him or only him, because all Buddhas, as he also said, all Buddhas are this of the same nature. There is total equality in that. So by honoring and remembering Buddha Shakyamuni, we are acknowledging and honoring the vast, the profound, and the commonly accessible truth, and therefore sets of truth within that great enunciation of truth that Buddha Shakyamuni gave. And as he descended from Tushita to heaven, which is what this image presents, and brought to this world a, the way, a path that will um, undeniably and assuredly produce the liberation of any being that chooses to take on that path, any kind of being, any being at all, and thereby will support and positively affect the liberation of all other beings. Then to honor Buddha Shakyamuni and to you know, say a praise like the one that Jen said, is is not only produces merit, but it is to remember this vastness that this being who came to the earth and turned the wheel of truth. And I don't know about you, but you know, I am often moved to tears with gratitude and um, um, the 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 scope. The va again, the vast and the profound, the scope of what this being offered humanity and, and the idea that three beings of the same caliber came before to this planet, this blessed and chosen planet for whatever reason to be... Um, to receive the Buddha Dharma, it, uh, uh, you know, I, I, am, I am made speechless quite often. And so we have our selections. So chime in here anytime you want. Really, it, it's no different than looking at the book, okay? 
and we will be looking at the book. And so we take note and acknowledge the source of the Dharma, as I just said, Buddha Shakyamuni, for our current age. If we turn to page 17, I thought it was actually a perfect selection from the totality of what could have been selected by these editors to begin the book with the story of Anatta Pindara. Um, Pindika is the Pali, and uh, Anatta Pindara is uh, Sanskrit. And the reason for that is because of this list of bullets here. If we looked at the list of bullets, and we will, um, basically the entirety of the turning of the wheel was all three wheels, but certainly, um, you know, the wheel as a total idea of the one Buddha vehicle, as he talks about in the Lotus Sutra. Um, that in just this interaction with Anatta Pindara, we have everything, basically. Uh, beginning with Anatta Pindara's confusion and doubt, which is on page 18, beginning at the top paragraph, and about, you know, halfway down or so, it says, but as he was going out from the town, light vanished, darkness appeared, and such fear, consternation, and terror arose in him that he wanted to turn back from there because he was headed towards the Buddha. And this yaka, which is, you know, one of Mara's minions, uh, made you know, spoke in his ear, basically whispered in his ear and told him, you know, don't keep going forward, you know, don't, uh, or rather, you know, keep on walking by, keep on walking by, don't stop. And then um, the terror and the darkness vanish. So if we just stop there, this is how it is for all of us. And not specific to the coming into the Dharma, coming to something that will be of value to our own sanity and our own path. Maybe the latter, yes. But we, we constantly doubt that which is simple, that which is for our well-being. Um, we are constantly confused by... Yes the by what is possible within us we are confused by the potential within us and so we fall you know we fall and we falter um and so this whole interaction is actually if you will it's it's a type of encapsulation of what samsara is and there are other factors of samsara, you know, aging, sickness, death, all of that. But, but doubt and confusion are aspects of samsara. They only happen in samsara. They are part of our samsaric identification, et cetera, et cetera. And to have Mara or one of his minions, you know, be so present, whispering in the ear, well, again, that happens to us all. That's that that negative voice about ourself, it's, it's that which causes us doubt, that which causes us confusion. So it's that self-dividedness inside us, which again is part of being a samsaric being. Um, so to have this be the beginning is perfect. So before I continue your thoughts, and your thoughts, hi, Joy.
Well, I'm just appreciating that you're addressing that because doubt and confusion are certainly things that pop up for we human beings along the path. That's for sure, that's for sure. And so Anatta Pandata does, you know, regains his, his sense of light and lightedness within him, and he approaches the Buddha. And so we're on page uh, 18, Joy, in the book, and approaches the Buddha. And the first question that he asks, so we're about two-thirds of the way down the page, uh, Anatta Pandata you know, comes near him, sees him, sees the Buddha in his walking meditation. It says pacing up and down. The Buddha is in cont contemplation. He is doing a walking meditation. That's so that's in, an instruction to us, of course. And Anatta Pandata, you know, says, oh, you know, comes towards him, and the Buddha calls him by name. His his mother's that is to say, the name his mother gave him, as opposed to what the community calls him. And so, wow, okay, who is who is a stranger, and how is it that he knows the name that my mother called me, right? And he and so Anatta Pandata asks the Buddha, um, "Is the Lord living at ease?" And the Buddha's response is huge, actually. And it is the first turn. It is almost everything within the first turning encapsulated. And then he's going to expand upon that as Anatta Pandata continues to listen and be entranced by the responses of the Buddha. But the Buddha says, yes, I am. You know, I always live at ease. Um, I am not stained by lust. My, you know, desires are cooled. There is no basis left for anything negative to arise. No negative karma is still there. No latent tendencies to, you know, com come up out of nowhere when I thought that I would address them. You know, I'm good, he says. You know, having rent all clings, having averted hot care. So that's about sentiment. Tranquil, he, I, live at ease. You know, he's not using the term I, everybody, because there is no I. So he's not using that term. And so I have one piece of mind to translate. Again, everything the Buddha says is a is not only an explanation, it is always an explanation of truth. But it also is instruction to us. So if we want to live at ease, then we want to produce that ease. And how do we produce that ease? By cooling our passions, by undoing our lusts, cravings, clingings, desires. And those two will remediate, will undo all bases from which further clingings arise, further attachments are there, disappointments also, etc., etc. So we will undo the bases of these including the basis of our karmic imprints. And so having rent all clingings, he repeats, and then we will live tranquilly. We will live tranquilly in ourselves. Our mind will be tranquil. Our emotions will be tranquil. Our body will have tranquility because, you know, it too is being respected and treated well. And so we will have peace of mind. Thoughts or questions there? Your thoughts, your, you know, how does this strike you?
Well, the first thing that comes to mind is it's a very stark pointer to the fact that um, we create our own reality as opposed to the commonly held notion that we're at the effect of things. Well said, very well said. Just under that paragraph, there's a couple more things, you know, in this list that are really, again, from the point of view of instruction are, and are very worthwhile, which he is not giving as an instruction per se to an Pindala, but is explaining. And that is, he, he went on to talk on giving moral habit on heaven, meaning nirvana, he explained the peril, the vanity, the depravity of pleasures of the senses, the advantage of renouncing them. So again, we too can take in that simple list, even if only for a half an hour in a day, and say, mm-hmm, I understand the peril of, of the pleasures of the senses there is a peril there that there is a vanity that is to say we we are abiding in a in a in a conceit that is um that disregards the truth of that peril as we engage our senses for example the pleasures of the senses we are in a vanity that uh, thinks it's better than or can somehow um, get away with the fallout from the pleasures of the senses. So al although the sentence is very simple, again, we, we, would do, we are well served when we stop and ponder and say, hmm, what do I think about that? So, so far, what he has done is he has, with, before he's even gotten to the Four Noble Truths, to Anatha Pindada, um, he still has totally illumined, well, maybe not totally, but he has illumined, again, the peril, the limitations, the, um, he uses the word depravity, you know, that kind of thing. These are strong words that in a, in a Western, you know, lifestyle of kind of ease and entitlement, we might or might not want to hear, um, but the strength of the words are being used in order to cause us to stop, to think, to ponder, to look at our own lives and, um, and decide what to do about that because our life of samsara and his life of liberation from samsara are exactly what he's talking about in this very first selection of this book. Then he gets to the Four Noble Truths, again, which just restate, there is suffering. Notice that, you know, we do have uh, aging, sickness, death. We have, we have, Worry, doubt, confusion, we have anger, anxiety, we have the list, whatever we have, we have attachments, we get hungry, you know, etc. Um, so that's the first truth, to simply acknowledge the obviousness, the everydayness of the first truth. And then the second, of course, as we all know, is that there is a cause to all of that. And the cause is very simply craving. Remember from uh, uh, the Buddha's ancient path, the Pali word was tanha, thirst, 
is what that translated to, but it means thirst as in craving, lust, um, uh, wanting to acquire, that whole kind of thing, clinging, craving. And then the third truth is that, well, guess what? You know, if there's a cause, the cause can be undone. So cessation is what the third truth is called. We can cease our own behavior patterns. We can cease the thoughts in our mind that, you know, are, are self-defeating and do not lead to liberation. We can cease these patterns. <clears throat> and, and even if we cease a pattern today, on the level at which we are living it, that does not mean that we've ceased the entirety of the pattern, but we have, but we have, we have chipped away at this. And that's, that's the path. The path is keep chipping away at the old and keep cultivating that which is uh, the path of liberation. And thus, to the fourth, to the fourth truth, he gives a list of eight methods, eight ways to live, eight ways to think about ourselves and our world that um, will produce a liberation from the three worlds. It will, the four, the four noble, the uh, eightfold path will produce liberation from the three worlds. Your thoughts. That was Joy's thought. <laughs> a sigh. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't admitted. Yeah. Well, the first thought was easier said than done, of course, but um, it, it depends on recognition of the pattern. So it depends on, you know, some kind of meditative, uh, ob observational kind of stance, which is. You know, a, a mind, a mindfulness, and mind development. So, how primary the right use of the mind is. Yeah, yeah. Which leads to then, still within this first little story here, taking refuge, and and that's what refuge actually is all about. Refuge is taking, you know, abiding in that self-recollectedness that the Master DK would talk about. And in that self-recollectedness is everything that we've just been talking about. So we take refuge in that. We take refuge in truth, that there is truth, that this is true, and that I can, that is to say, samsara is true, uh, trouble is true, Self-made reality is true, but also because self-made reality is true, then a new reality can be made. We, 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 we are well served to remember the, both sides of that statement. Because self-reality is self-made, we can make whatever reality we want. And of course, when you get into the Vajrayana and you're doing deity yoga practices, you are completely self-making your reality into, into a Buddha being and all its, all those attributes. So that's what taking refuge fundamentally is. You know, into our Buddha nature, into the Dharma, into the truth. And, and that we're not alone in all of this. You know, we we have support if we want to avail ourselves of it, whether it be through reading a book like this or the books written by the masters or the or the sutras themselves. And we have support of just fellowship, you know. So that's what that's about. And then of course, uh, in the end, Anatta Pandata gives a section of forest to the uh 
to the Buddha and to the Sangha for them to use on their, uh, you know, one of the season's retreats. So they use it, re, you know, they use it for decades. And it still exists, the Jetta Grove. It's not like it was 2,500 years ago, but it is still, it's not a city. It's not something like that. It hasn't been taken over in that way. Um, so that is simply brought out in the story and in our first slide here as, as offerings, offerings to the Buddha. So whether we have a little Buddha shrine or altar in our house or and we you know light a candle or we just say a prayer in the morning or whatever we do of thank you and i offer my day to the buddha the dharma and the sangha or we anytime through the day offer the moment the insight the suffering the the joy the sunshine offer anything the fact that we can take a walk wherever we want, I mean, whatever it is, we offer that to the Buddha, then that, that is from a Dharma, from the emptiness of all Dharma's point of view, then that's just the same as, as Anatta Pandata giving the gift of the Jetta Grove to the Buddha. I wanted to add that also it, taking refuge, I think, means that we no longer um, uh, judge ourselves. <laughs> We've opened ourselves to that which is the true reality, that which exists. And, and so all of that self-remembering is to be without judgment. Very good. Thank you for that, Joy. Thank you. Page 33, and briefly so, I've, I've given a little bit of a different um, um, rendition of this because it comes from the Dhammapada, same, but it's the same quote, just translated a little differently. So luminous is the mind brightly shining. We've used that in meditation as well. And so with this statement, the Buddha is declaring uh, the, the obvious as well as the profound, that our natural state of, of awareness mind is, is not what is commonly developed by us and, and society that natural state of bright, undefiled, unperturbed, etc., vast and profound, is, is not what most people hang out in and don't even know exists. And when something of a transcendent quality or such a simplified as to be... Um, um, resplendent unto itself because it's so simple. When that occurs or flashes for someone, um, most people consider that transcendent, that they've been blessed by something or someone transcendent and external to them as opposed to that being a natural, innate something that, you know, just tried to, to, to let us know that it exists. Whereas the Buddha says, you know, those who are wise, cultivate, come to know this luminous mind. And so we are encouraged to do that. And if we go right back to another Pandata, this luminous mind is, of course, that which is free from the tr troublesome thoughts so as we cultivate a luminous mind, we are also undoing cravings, clingings, troublesome thoughts, doubts, confusions. Anything to add there, anybody? Let's 
excuse me, then we have this wonderful phrase, you know, Dharma has been taught with me, by me, page 35, without making a distinction between the esoteric and the exoteric. And it has, has been already talked about. With this statement in the first turning, the entirety of the Buddha Dhamma has been included and has been encouraged. Uh, we have been encouraged as practitioners to look beyond the surface and literal me words and meanings of the words um, that were given. So that does not mean to skip over the literal and the instructional that are in those um, words given as they were given. That's not to say that. But it is to say that after we do try to apply or do livingly apply, those literal instructions like the four mindfulnesses, like, you know, walking meditation, feel your heel come up, your sole of your next foot go down, feel the muscles in your calf, feel your stature, feel the literality of being embodied and of walking meditatively. But once that is established for us, then yes, start to go more deeply. Find the esoteric within the exoteric. What we will find if we do that, that is to say, take the literality of the teaching and, and do, our, our, do what we can to apply that. We will find that within that application also, that the esoteric within us, the inner, the deeper within us, will automatically start to come forward. This, and this is, is behind the idea of dropping in also. On page 42 under the Arhats, you know, without taking up the whole list here, um, just how is it that someone attains peace? Well, the Buddha already said how to do it. So he just repeats it here regarding those human beings who have on the level of our common everyday existence, our three world existence. That's what an arhat is. Someone who has attained peace in the three worlds, while living in the three worlds, and while living a three-world existence. And so, you know, here's the list taken from here. It's one, one could, of course, say, well, wow, that's quite the list. You know, no craving is found in them, just that alone, right? Um, well, yeah, so move on. <laughs> <laughs> Just move on because that kind of a statement to oneself is self-defeating. So just move on, attend to one's craving. You know, the I am is rooted out. You know, one can say, well, why would I want to do that? Well, experiment with it and, and see what you find out. Confusion's nest, net is burst, meaning we are, we are bound we are bound up, we are caught in a net of confusion. Our entirety is a net of confusion. And so how do we break free of that confusion? How do we break free of the net? That is to say the, the causes, the conditions, the web work that we create and recreate for ourselves. So again, self-made reality there, et cetera. Um, comprehending the five groups, i.e. comprehending the skandhas, their related sense organ, and their related sense consciousness. So that's why it says five groups. It's, yes, it's the groups, meaning aggregate is a group. Yes. But then it also means the, the 
ancillary, um, you know, in Sanskrit, the, the ayutamas and the datus that are related to that. <clears throat> and then it says pasturing their five, their seven mental states. So to pasture, to put something out to pasture is to, um, is to give it freedom, but there's an ease, again, a peace, you know, uh, just kind of feel that within ourselves. And that has to do with the seven out of the eight consciousnesses, because the eighth is the alaya, and the eighth is the ground or fundamental consciousness, which, you know, you can't put out into pasture. It's, 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 it, it's part of our Buddha nature, actually. So we can't do much with that, per se. We can do plenty with the other seven. And by doing what we can with the other seven, the eighth is clarified, if you will, purified and pacified. But only because the seven are actually what we are purifying, clarifying, pacifying. Any thoughts or questions before we move on? Could you just name those seven or some of the seven so I have an idea of the category? <clears throat> I can only give you six, um, and they are related to the six senses. So six okay. meaning you add the mind, the, the sixth sense of the mind. But mind here, we're talking about it in a common way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the book that we're going to get into lists it. And if anyone has another book that we took up already, which is also Trungpa, um, and that was the uh, glimpses, glimpses of the Abhidhamma. Glimpses mm -hmm. of the Abhidhamma, of course, focuses a lot on this and lists, lists all eight. Um, I can I can find it for you, but I can't find it for you till I get home tonight. No, 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 that's okay. I just was not quite knowing where to put my mind on that, but I and I have an idea. Thank you. Yeah, it's the six the six senses, and in, again, including the mind. I can't think of what the seventh is, and then but the eighth is the alaya, the the ground, the fundamental uh, state of consciousness that basically is awareness. Um, on a on a non awakened turn of the spiral, so to speak, and is born of our Buddha nature. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The Buddha goes on to say that one, you know, if 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 all this kind of, and this is still within the first turning. If all this focus on our on our belly button, right, on our navel, just, you know, gets to be too much. It almost seems to be all focused on what is shitty. Including what's shitty inside me that I keep telling myself. If all of that gets to be, gets to be too much, well, focus on the lovely. And so that's on page 82, it's number 71. Because of my friendship with the lovely, I am freed from birth, aging, decaying, dying. Thus you must train. Become a friend, an associate, an intimate of the lovely. And what is that? What is the lovely? Before we, we read the last sentence, because it's about wholesome mental states. The lovely is anything that's lovely. Anything that is wholesome. You know, in the, in the Mahayana, that phrase is used a lot. Wholesome roots. So virtue. Serenity. Tranquility, simplicity, beauty, truth, like truth of being. Certainly, you know, to enjoy nature, to enjoy the heart of another human being. 
etc. So there's all kinds of ways that the lovely can be engaged. And then the Buddha completes with, you know, to, to, to have diligence, to with diligence um, establish oneself in a wholesome mental state. Now, what's interesting is that that is almost, um, the Patanjali has a sutra that says almost the exact thing. And he approaches it as in, you know, if there's a troublesome mental state, cultivate the opposite. So don't hang out in the troublesome. Don't keep repeating that to yourself because it's untrue. It's a self-flagellation. So instead, just cultivate the opposite. Any thoughts or questions there? I have a question. Like, are we, are we always in the, one of the six realms? I mean, is that until we're out of, until we're not? But are, are we, do we spend our day going between those realms all the time? Or is it only when we have afflicted states that we are in one of those realms? Always. So as an example, you hanging out under a 12,000 foot mountain, having a nice walk on a beautiful sunny day, you're in the God realm. While, you're, while, while your mind is enjoying that wonderful experience. Now, if while you're walking in that blissful heavenly state, that means the heaven, heaven world, if while you're walking, your mind is fretting about something and, and just can't get rid of it, then although you are in a heaven world from a, from a six worlds point of view, although you're in a heaven world, you have fallen. You have been a god that has fallen from that pure land into a lower realm. And then um, depending on what one is fretting about, that would say which of the lower realms one has fallen to. Does that all make sense? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking that, but I hadn't realized it was full time until I started to think about it. <laughs> Pretty much is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we bounce around a lot. And of course, you know, if we were to couple, uh, which would be very wise to do, um, if we were to couple the idea of the bardos, that each of these. Um, each of these states is itself a bardo, that's first. But then right. the shifting that, you know, you're, 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 one is in Shangri-La, but at the same time, one is in hell within oneself. So whatever was something shifted, but shifted us from the hev heavenly state into the hell realm in our mind. And... If we could, if we could catch, rewind, do something, so that we could catch what happened, you know, um, what happened there, right? Then we would be, we would itemize or or, or reveal to ourselves the between the bardo, as in the between the intermediate state that that plummeted us. From So in that case, to just follow the analogy and the teaching, we would have encountered a wrathful deity, but of course it's inside ourself. It's one of our own thought forms. Um, we would have encountered a wrathful deity, which again shifted us into a different bardo, which is a different of the six worlds. Right, and then we get out of that bardo by realizing that we are trapped there and kind of doing the analysis to move us to a different spot. Yes. Uh-huh. 
and the and, and and every the deeper teaching on the bardos as has already been said i think in in a variety of environments that everyone's been at the deeper teaching on the bardos is 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 that gap you know trungpa talks about the gap is that segue use that term is the segue that gets us from one to the other the if we can catch the segue the segue is the opportunity for the application of a method of liberation or a method of samsaric reinstatement and that's mm -hmm. key is to always catch try to catch as often as possible even if once a day once a day is more than none a day and that's so important right and then yeah sure uh -huh. of course the first turning is it completes basically with the idea of empty of the of phenomena that is to say the world our sense of self both are without uh they are without identity they are with, they are selfless they are signless mark less as in no characteristics so you know this is from page 91 and verse 81 for the top bullet i think top two bullets and then we complete with from 82 verse 82 um, about the mind and the same thing is said for both to what extent is the world called empty lord it is empty because it is empty of self and what belongs to self and what is the freedom of the mind Ah, the freedom of the mind is that it is empty of self and what belongs to self. It is empty of passion. The mind is empty of aversion. The mind unto its own nature is empty of confusion. So if we have an aversion, we have a passion, we have a confusion, the Buddha is telling us we are not in our mind. We are in our emotions. We are in our cravings. We are in our, we are in our, um, yeah, we are in our, our, our emotions. But we're not in our mind. That's a powerful thing to contemplate. And a powerful thing to bring forward as a reminder to oneself when we are in a moment of passion when we are in aversion avoidance dismissal denial etc when we are in a state of confusion doubt worry anxiety all these things are all parts of confusion misidentification etc to simply remind ourselves that whatever we're experiencing right now is actually not of our mind It's of our emotions and our identification with our emotions, including our passions, convictions, beliefs, what we would like to have be real. I mean, whatever it might be. And it's very powerful. Thoughts or questions? Well, and to remember that, um I mean, it kind of wakes us up to the fact that the whole astral plane is, you know, created by uh, uh, all these cravings and, and confusion, et cetera, and is a non-reality. Right. 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 And so the Buddha says, well, this passion is the way. Through dispassion, one is freed. It sounds so simple to, you know, the words are so simple. And then as human beings, you know, we have whatever 
measure of ease with that and measure of challenge with that. That's the nature of being human. So again, we just chip away at it. This is why diligence, steadfastness, uh, vigilance, um, accepting ourselves with all of our failings, as well as accepting that our, uh, our, our essential beingness, call it whatever you want, you know, monad, triad, Buddha nature, Christ nature, call it whatever we want. But our essential beingness is not all this confused, is not clinging and craving and all of that. It, just, it, it isn't, and it doesn't have trails of karma, you know, not all of which is troublesome, but it just doesn't have any of that either. And I, and I can only speak for myself that it is those reminders when I need to call forward dispassion or, or self-disinterestedness that, um, you know, I remind myself of, yeah, you know, what's arising is just that. It's just, it's a cloud in the sky. And then he, we enter into the tail end here of where we were sat, where we were reading. And he sought to turn the, uh, you know, we've entered into the Mahayana in the book. And so we have the second turning. And let me just find where I am here. Yes, so on page 125, we have verse 63 through 65, or verse 63 and 64. So he's, he's, the Buddha now is making the distinction of what he had taught before about nirvana and it, and it being a result of, you know, liberating oneself from the, from the um, three worlds i.e. becoming an arhat and a pratyeka buddha. But that's not really nirvana. That is, an, that is an extinction of the bases by which the, the, the skandhas are fed. And therefore, the fundamental ongoing sense of identification with the three worlds as well as with again feeling nature form nature mental constructs etc how those are all fed yes the the we've escaped that we've undone the bases for those yes but the blissful state that one is hanging out in is 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 still provisional is what he's telling in in these uh, in this selection here that if we want to really uh, um, affect an extinction an extinguishing and thus um, uh, access and abide in Buddha nature, then we have to understand that all Dharmas are deathless, all dharmas are the same, and all dharmas are like illusions. So we're at the bottom bullet. All dharmas are like illusions, a dream. They are similar to an echo. The, the person who knows that all dharmas are the same, that they are empty, that they are essentially without multiplicity, then that person understands that all dharmas are the same, quite the same. And so we pulled from a few different things here, including uh, number 83 on page 127, all dhammas are the same, all, all dhammas are always quite the same. So we've pulled from a few different ones just to collect it together. Any thoughts or questions?
I have a question. Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, on I-81 there, he says he does not look, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. 82. On 82. Um, Page 82? Then Great Leap Wise. Oh, okay, no, yeah. One yep. Mm -hmm. Then Great Leap Wise, he sees the Dharma body completely. There is no triad of vehicles, but there is only one vehicle. Is he speaking of there's, there's no difference between the mind and the emotions and the body that um, have kind of be no he's talking about yanas okay so there's no shravaka yana hinayana there's oh, okay, no so. right it's that there's only one buddha vehicle and this comes from the lotus sutra the sadama pundarika is the lotus sutra where that is the main the the main subject that there is one buddha vehicle and the so three the, the turnings dawn. the three turnings are a device a device needed because people and beings are at different capacities and different interest levels Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Bodhisattva is born of the first turning. The Bodhisattva has practiced the first turning, has practiced such that the Bodhisattva's personal passions are done. Their personal karma is done. Their personal uh, their their focus on their self is done. So, granted, there are you know all the levels of bodhisattva, etc. But these foundations, and I'm not saying them from the point of view of um, um, black and white. I'm saying them so that we understand that the first turning produces in us all a clarity, a simplification, a purity, an aspiration. You know, we've aspired through the first turning to be a better human being, to free ourselves from the ongoing problems of being a self. So the first turning has affected not only changes, transmutations, and transformations within ourselves, but but because we have experienced for ourselves the blessings of, of that self work on ourself, we then discover that, oh, well, wow, I'm feeling so much better. I, I wish the same for other people, for other beings. And because I could affect such and such. Um, liberation or ease or, or less consternation or less confusion because I could affect that within myself just simply by attending to it. Well, then I see that if I could do that with myself, then maybe I can, I can somehow foster, foster and support others in doing the same. Maybe somehow I can, um, you know, set my sights to helping others, you know, free themselves from the same consternation that I was constantly beset by. So the Bodhisattva is born of the, of the Shravakayana, the Hinayana path. Let's never lose sight of that. You cannot become a nobody. No being can become a bodhisattva without attending to everything that has to go before that. You can't jump over. Now, we might be attending to it for eons of time, that is to say the Hinayana, the Shravakayana, and not remember it. And so come in and think that, oh, okay, 
you know, such and such is fairly well dealt with and I can put, set my sights to other beings. That might be so, but that's, a, that's, that's called, you know, selective, selective memory. That's all. But what is a bodhisattva? Well, having, having actually radiated friendliness to oneself, because that's what all the, basically, the Hinayana path is, to actually, actually befriend ourselves so fully that we no longer poison ourselves, punish ourselves, limit ourselves, confuse ourselves, wind ourselves up in a net of confusion and, and limitation. So we, have, having radiated friendliness to ourselves, we now want to radiate friendliness and compassion to other beings. And so inside ourselves, just as we've become a savior to the very devas and forms and thought forms inside ourselves, we want to become a savior and a helpful being to others and release them from suffering, just like we have released ourselves from suffering to the extent that we have. Any thoughts or questions there? And we complete with perfect wisdom. That as we do everything that's been already talked about and little by little establish ourselves in habits of the lovely. Um, kindness, friendliness to ourselves. We will all discover that which is innate. And that which is innate is described in, in one way or one description of that. It's perfect wisdom. Uh, there are other descriptions like Tathagatagaba, etc. But one is perfect wisdom. And so we have this quote from this page. And all of this is describing our pure being, which of course is, is perfect wisdom. But perfect wisdom is also perfect compassion. Perfect compassion is also perfect friendliness. Perfect friendliness is also perfect equanimity. Perfect equanimity is also mirror-like wisdom. Mirror-like wisdom is also uh, always accomplishing that which is perfectly needed in any given moment. So it is all accomplishing wisdom etc etc any final thoughts or questions I, I like that thought of friendliness it makes it so much more normal and easy as opposed to imagining it's something hard or unattainable. Yes, very much. Donna, that was a nice interpretation. You know, we have cliff notes and now we have Donna notes. Yeah. For this, uh, for <laughs> I hope I hope it's all been helpful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was. Go ahead, Linda. Go ahead, Linda. No, I was just going to say yes. It was very helpful. Good, good. <laughs> and sorry, Jen, you you were trying to say something. 
Oh, I was just the same, saying the same. Okay. Good. Good. I'm glad everybody. So we'll see you all next week with the new book. And um, I'll send a note. You know, if you if you get it, there's about I don't know, 17, maybe close to 20 pages of preliminary stuff. Like there's short forwards written by a number of different people, you know, all praising Trumpa. And um, so we won't, we won't necessarily take up that kind of stuff unless anybody wants to um, when we get together. So if you do get the book, after you read that, we'll focus on the introduction itself. That's where we'll start. Okay, and that is online. If anybody wants to look at it on Amazon, you can turn the pages and read it. Thank you. Are you sending this along, Donna? I will, sure. With slides, please. Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.